13 years of mystery. He lay there on the ground of that in that doorway of Superbike and took his last breath. Solved in the most unlikely confession. We got him today. What would cause this to take place on the 13 year anniversary? It's just unreal. Bringing justice to the victim's families. When he hit that gavel down and, and said he was sentenced to life, it was like 100 pounds rolled off my shoulder. And pain and disbelief to his own. And I looked at him and I said, Todd, did you kill those people out at the motorbike place? And he looked at me, he says, yes. Tonight, for the first time, we're hearing from Superbike Motorsports' final customer before the murders. 7 News at 6 presents A Killer Among Us, The Unsealed Files of Todd Kohlhepp. For 13 years, a pencil sketch and a nameless receipt for a bike was all deputies had to go on to solve one of the most infamous crimes in Spartanburg County history. As the years passed, the case went cold, and the hundreds of leads about who was behind the four murders at Superbike Motorsports all dried up. Well, now we all know who killed those people. Tonight, we're hearing from the final customer of that bike store. 7 News reporter Brianna Smith has more about the killer among us. The most notorious crime of Spartanburg County. Four people gunned down in the middle of the day just trying to make a living at their business. The only piece of information deputies had to go on was a description of a customer made by a witness just moments before the shooting happened. For 13 years, the secrets of that day have been locked up. But tonight, we're unsealing the files. Horrific. Uh, you know, you had, you had four bodies. Superbike Motorsports, a bike shop in the middle of rural Chesney, South Carolina, bringing in nearly $100,000 a month. Life was good until November 6th, 2003. Apparently, everybody's been shot up here. His mama's been shot, the mechanic's been shot, and the owner. We found uh, four individuals. Uh, they were all dead. They had appeared to have been shot. A major murder investigation opens up for a sheriff's department staff with dozens of investigators who had never experienced any case like this, searching for the answer to their biggest question, why? Figuring out um, was one of the victims the actual target and the other people, were they just casualties? Uh, was the business the actual target? Uh, it, it really torn our resources and, and many different directions. Deputies scoured the property. They found 18 shell casings from a 9 millimeter gun. They started dusting for prints and doing interviews. But with no immediate leads, they finally got the break they needed, a possible witness. Does that day still pretty clear? Because Oh, of yeah. I mean, it was like it, every time I go by it. On November 6, 2003, Kelly Sisk, home from North Carolina on a National Guard assignment, made his way to Superbike Motorsports. He had to make a payment on a go-kart that he was buying for his son. I was probably in there a good 30, 45 minutes. Good. I mean, I was in there a little while because I, I didn't go in there just to pay. I always went in there and looked. As Sisk wandered around daydreaming of his own bike, Scott Ponder started focusing on another customer, looking at a black Suzuki in the showroom. And I overheard him say, hey, this is a good beginner's bike. And I'm like, that's a pretty big bike for a beginner. But, you know, Scott knew his bikes. Sisk and his four-year-old son left, leaving that customer and Scott still discussing that black bike. That would be the last time that anyone would see Scott Ponder alive. What was your first thought? It was, oh, my God, I was just in there. And I had my son with me. Deputies immediately questioned Sisk about what he yeah, knew, what he saw. I, I said I really couldn't tell about his hair, but it kind of looked like it was feathered. And the first description of a possible suspect is erected. I said he had small eyes, I mean, were kind of squinty, you know, um, narrow lips, um, you know, not such a big chiseled jaw. The descriptions of these individuals that I... Days went by and the case was still unsolved, but deputies weren't counting time, they were counting tips. Because of the magnitude of the case and the fact that you had four dead bodies, um, you, you actually had information that was coming in that needed to be worked, and it was an overwhelming amount of information. A picture of what happened inside that bike shop begins to develop. In theory, this could be a projectile from there. The frustration came in because of the lack of evidence in this case. You just didn't, you just didn't have it. 
With no unidentified fingerprints or DNA, all deputies had to go on was a bill of sale for a black Suzuki bike that didn't have a buyer's name. It was the same black Suzuki bike that was found in the shop being prepped for delivery. I went back in there and I said, where's the bike that was sitting right here? They took me to the garage and they said, you're talking about that bike? I said, yeah, that one. That's the bike that was sitting over there. That bike was being processed to put out. Okay. So that's when you knew you were... I knew something was up then. I said, because why is that bike back here? That was very important. That whole story behind this customer, um, that that's the motorcycle being worked on, the bill of origin, the bill of sales there, and the customer's just vanished. Where is this customer? Who is this customer? For the next two years, Steve Cooper and his team focused on the profile of this angry customer. They're mad at something that happened, business practice with the shop, something there is where their anger is, not to an individual. The evidence told their story. But if you look at where these items are here. It shows calculated acts in a path of rage. The shooter starting in the back, killing Chris Sherbert as he was working on that bike, moving his way into the showroom, shooting Beverly Guy as he started towards Brian Lucas and Scott Ponder, killing them as they were running out the front door for help. And in Scott's final moments alive, dialing 333. Melissa was the third favorite in his phone. So there's been theory that he was trying to call her. A phone call never made. A sketch of a skilled shooter revealed, but one with no name. What am I missing? And that's what, that, that's what keeps you up at night. You know, that's the phrase that really got me when I was doing these interviews is, what am I missing? Yeah. For 13 years, yeah. the, the case file is five cabinets deep. And to go through that, what am I missing every day and day in and out? How different things could have been if there had been a name on that bill of sale. But there's also an article of clothing, Brianna, that has come to play in all of this. What did you find out about yeah, that? Yeah, so we talked to Kelly about that. I said, was there anything weird about Todd? Because, you know, we've seen his interactions now, and it's kind of strange. And I said, was there anything weird? He said, well, he had a jacket on, and I remember it being warm for November. Well, they said that in several of the reports that we were looking for somebody with a leather jacket. Mm -hmm. Todd said, I was wearing a black Columbia fleece, and oh. I still have it. Okay. And that was a piece of evidence that they pulled from his house at Wood Song Way and more. The jacket was still there. Still there. All right, Brianna, much more to come. Yep, Thank every you day this week. Thanks for that tonight. We'll stay with 7 News as we continue to break down never before heard details of this case that Brianna got exclusive access to. It's all part of our special week long series, A Killer Among Us The Unsealed Files of Todd Kolhab. It continues tomorrow here on 7 News at 6.